12 years ago, but you found a typo and fixed it, the 12 year clock begins again. Um, offhand, we've only skimmed this, but there doesn't seem to be substantive uh, measures for it. So let's, let's see. I think those are things we need to look at because that's a death by a thousand cuts of your rights. Um, and mine, so that's also part of the reason. Oh my lordy, <laughs> um, we have to fight. Maria, uh, sorry, ten. A portion Hi. of a portion of the of the decision actually discusses uh, Maria's liability. It mentions Maria's uh, uh, position as executive editor, which the court said is a clever ruse to avoid liability of the officers of a news organization who can be held responsible for libel. May we know the difference between the position of an executive editor and an editor-in-chief? And I think this underscores the difference between print and online media. Okay, got it. So, my lawyer just tells me, you know, this will be the subject of the appeal. Thank you, Mr. Lawyer. Um, but, yes, so an executive editor in Rappler, and, you know, if you look at the wording of it, uh, I read it very quickly, and I had strong reactions. But um, the executive editor, what I am in charge of is our sales, our tech, um, our strategic direction. I have very little involvement in the day-to-day, -day, unless it's a story about terrorism. <laughs> you know, the things that I think there are only two topics that I look in on. But the running of the day-to-day -day is our managing editor, Glenda Gloria, and then we break it up. So we, I think part of this is that old names, old rules were applied for a completely new situation. And for a decision that actually says it is addressing a new threat, it uses old words, old ideas, and old comprehension of this. Right? Rappler is a test case on so many fronts. So an executive editor isn't exactly an EAC. Sorry. So an executive editor isn't exactly a, an EAC, as the uh, court seems to uh, suggest. An executive editor. An executive isn't editor isn't exactly. An EAC, an editor-in-chief. Yeah, it's definitely not an editor-in-chief because it's more, I guess, publisher, uh, editor. I mean, it's it's actually, these are some of the things Ted is going to have to look at. But, you know, this was our title when we began, when we started this company from nothing in 2011, the end of 2011. And um, you can see, with all the travels I do, you can see it's impossible for me to be involved in day-to-day. -day. But I do set strategic direction for Rappler the, the platform that you see, baby, the, the new platform, Lighthouse, that's something that I was heavily, that's, that's my baby, right? So we, I think one of the nice things about Rappler is that you can redefine what used to be and then fit it to the landscape that we live in today, the context we live in today. Thanks, Mike. Hi, good morning. AC Nichols from CNN Philippines. What does this mean for Rappler as a news organization moving forward? I mean, I know that this is not the only case you're facing, but I believe this is the first ruling and it's a conviction. So, moving forward, where do you see Rappler going? I have first-hand knowledge of the abuse of my rights, the violation of my rights. Rappler has been under attack for four years, right? And I think, where are we going? <laughs> we know firsthand we are going to be, uh, the, the mission of Rappler remains the same, and we will carry it out with far more, well, it can't be far more, because we've already thrown everything into this. I think this is a pivotal moment for the Philippines, and a pivotal moment for, not just for our democracy, but for the idea of what a free press means. And the thing is, it's not just in our country, it's all around the world, right? If you think about it, uh, anything, and this is partly because of social media, anything that happens here will ripple all the way through uh, the live stream that, that is on right now. There is a lawyer, our, one of our lead counsels from London, there's someone else from Australia, there's someone else from the United States. Um, I think we're redefining what the new world is going to look like, what journalism is going to become. Are we going to lose freedom of the press? Will it be death by a thousand cuts? 
or are we going to hold the line so that we protect the rights that are enshrined in our Constitution? Even if power attacks you directly, and this is what our colleagues in the West are dealing with now, right? How do you deal with that when the people you're covering are the ones attacking you? Short answer, we're going to be, we're going to aim to be better, stronger, investigative journalism must continue, and please, I, I really, you know, all of us should be doing this because we're at the precipice. If we fall over, we're no longer a democracy, and in many ways, that could be easier for all of us, right? I've worked under Suharto in Indonesia, Deng Xiaoping in China. The rules are very clear. This kind of gray area where if you go too far, you know, you'll get slammed. Let's not play the game. Are we a democracy or not? Let us do our jobs. Hi, I'm uh, Joanna Valleran from GG Press. My question is for Ray Santos. Um, I just want to ask, uh, you've been uh, out of Rappler for many years now. You're, you've worked in the public sector. Now you're with the private sector. How do you feel now that uh, there's a conviction? Uh, okay. Uh... Uh, I can't. I can't actually describe it. Um, a lot of thoughts are coming in my mind now. Um, sad, disappointed. Maria, Maria. Um, well, I'm no Maria, or I, I, I'm not a lawyer, um, and yet I'm dragged in this issue. So uh, it's sad. It, it's very sad, and. Um, for, for someone who's doing his job um, to be here, uh, I think it could be not just me, but other people who are doing his or her job properly uh, could be in the same situation that I am in right now. So, uh, well, I, I, I haven't seen, I haven't read the, the, uh, the promulgation yet, so there still are a lot of things to be discussed. Aterita, just asking lang, um, what do you make of the uh, imposition of a jail sentence because they heavily quoted from Tulfo, the Supreme Court, where the Supreme Court removed uh, a jail sentence and just imposed fines, yet here there was a jail sentence? Uh, well, that's, that's always in the discretion of the court. So even in the case of Tulfo, which they cited, uh, it was the discussion of the court. So when, when, the, when the penalty is given to the court's discretion, the court is free uh, to exercise whether uh, to impose imprisonment or a fine. Uh, would we have preferred a fine? Uh, we would have preferred acquittal. But uh, in this case, the court went with uh, imprisonment. The, the range however, is pretty much within the range of the penalty that can be imposed. It is pretty much uh, the entire range of the indeterminate sentence. Uh, and so, yeah, that, again, that leaves us with some legal discussions on how to go forward with this. There are implications. I will not mention them yet here because we, I re we really have not talked about it. There, will, there, will, there might be implications on what, what next steps to do legally. Attorney Ted, what is going to be the process for the payment of the moral and exemplary damages? Is that going to be immediate? Well, no. That's, that's contingent on the judgment becoming final. So should, should the judgment become final, then that's the only time. Uh, right now, uh, we have a 15-day period to consider options. And so, yes, we will, we will take that 15-day period to consider options. But no, uh, the, the monetary award of damages is not uh, immediately executory. It is subject to review. And so it becomes, it becomes executory only upon finality of the judgment. Morning.